Um, so hi CJ, hi Weixiang, uh, welcome to RWC uh, community webinar. Great to be here. Yep. Thank you for the invite. Yep. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, the webinar today is a part of the ongoing RWC community webinar series, which was started uh, last year, uh, ironically due to the lockdown. And it started off as uh, my way of uh, reaching out to all my clients because I really had nothing to do at home at the time. Mm. And uh, it's turned out to be a popular platform. Uh, quite a number of people follow it. So I'm very thankful to our followers. Now, in recent times, uh, RWC have noticed the cry for help from the mass participation sports, which I think both CG Lim and Mr. Ku Wei Xiang will be sharing with us what does that mean. The idea of today's uh, webinar is uh, actually threefold. Number one, to see how it was uh, before COVID-19. Of course, both the speakers will explain to you what it means by it was, what was the was in 2019, and then how it has been since the lockdown, and how has this affected the sports economy, the impact on the peripheral, the outer layer of the sports economy, and moving forward, how can we, um, how can we resolve this? So um, uh, we will be interviewing the two speakers who uh, will be sharing their views. So Mr. Lim, of course, is a well-known uh, gentleman from the Ironman community. And Mr. Ku, uh, his company is a very important company for keeping time, literally the time man, right? Now, without further ado, um, while uh, this could be RWC, and of course, I, I am Richard Wee. I, I, I am the RW in the RWC. Um, but today is all about me. Today is about these two gentlemen and the industry of mass participation sports. Can I first invite uh, Mr. C. G. Lim to introduce yourself and uh, maybe share with us what your company do, uh, what kind of uh, sports business are you in? All yours, uh, C. G. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Um, thanks. I'm C. G. Actually, I'm the uh, regional uh, director for Malaysia, um, and I take care of the Ironman events and Ironman license here. Uh, we're actually a subsidiary company of the Ironman USA. Uh, based in Tampa, uh, USA. So technically what we do here is we manage and uh, we own the Ironman events uh, in Malaysia. We also look after uh, operational support in Thailand as well in terms of Ironman events. We also do manage events for big brands in Malaysia. We support uh, big brands like Nestle and all for the activations in Malaysia. So we have been here for the last, uh, well, eight years now as a, actually Ironman subsidiary company. Prior to that, Ironman events in Malaysia were under a license uh, model. Uh, but in 2014, we took over with the support of uh, Motec and MySEP. Uh, we directly own all the events here in Malaysia. Ah, nice, nice. So you're the, you're the, you're the man behind Iron Man. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I, I guess for you, uh, CG, zero events. Lah. We can't do any Iron Man since 2020, isn't it? Yeah, unfortunately, because um, Iron Man events in Malaysia are very much a, a sport tourism centric type of event. Um, mm. 65 to 70% of my customers are all from outside of the country. Uh, they come into the country to race, they enjoy, they have holiday, and they leave the country. So with the borders closed, uh, with the limitation of having uh, large-scale and uh, international events here, uh, for the last, well, now 13 months now, uh, we have not uh, been able to do any Ironman uh, branded events here in Malaysia. Yeah, that's, that's tough, man. That's tough for you guys. And, and imagine all those uh, athletes, um, who's been training? Uh, we all know Ironman athletes train all the time. Now they yeah. train and they got nowhere to lapas tension and no way to challenge themselves. Exactly, exactly. I get texts yeah. and uh, messages every day. It's asking when is the event going to happen? Uh, when can they get back to racing? Um, I mean, Ironman athletes are always very um, active uh, whole year round. They typically join more than one uh, Ironman branded events, either Ironman 70.3 or Food Distance Ironman. So being out of action for 13 months, it's, uh, it's really tough for them. I feel them. Yeah. Yeah. Even for yeah. us as well, me and my team, we really want to get on the ground, uh, stand under the sun uh, and, and get things happen, you know, make things happen, get the events up and running. Uh, look, I'm, I'm probably the, the, the most fair in, uh, in, my, in my 20 years of uh, events life. I've never been so untanned before. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so we're going to get, come back to you more because I think the word mass participant needs some uh, definition. And I think uh, Iron Man event will be the ideal place to go there. So now, now, now let's go to the man with the time. So Mr. Ku Wei Xiang, is a, he runs a company, a very interesting company called the Championship Time. Uh, maybe Wei Xiang, of course, you can share with us your name, uh, what your company does, and how is your involvement in the sports industry? All yours, Wei Xiang. I thank you, Richard. Um, well, championship has uh, been around since 2003, so that makes us about uh, 17, 18 years old. Uh, we sort of pioneered RFID timing in Malaysia back then. So we, it's a migration from everything manual. Uh, imagine IMN doing everything in manual, participants come in and you have uh, all participants come in and you have to find ways to uh, track down what's their timing and everything and to find their ranking and all. So when this RFID timing came aboard, uh, it was a big revolution for the whole sporting market or the whole sporting industry uh, worldwide. And then when in 2003, when we started, uh, we also revolution, revolutionized this uh, industry itself in Malaysia. Uh, back then, it was very much very, very new and foreign to a lot of the users. Uh, a lot of them were wondering what is this thing that I need to put on to my shoe or wear it to myself to get my time. So it was very, very foreign. Uh, it took a bit of uh, education and recalibration uh, of the users and participants uh, in, in the industry itself. And um, by now, uh, every, any event that you go to uh, is very weird that you do not have a timing uh, RFID chip attached to them. So there, there's that part. Uh, myself, what I do, uh, I'm the technical operations and also the new business development for Championship uh, itself. And um, that that's the, the main uh, component and activities that I do. Yeah. Well done, Wiesel. And then um, the funny thing is about your business is that unfortunately, there's no events, there's no chip. Yes. So there is a... You are the perfect person to speak to about the secondary impact of the <laughs> events. Yes. The yes. direct impact of, on people like CG, they are the direct, they, they, the events can't move, right? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit about your RFID. I mean, do you make the chip? Do you import the chip? Uh, the, yeah, so the, the chip we use uh, is one of the manufacturers in, in the world. So I think that currently there's about a handful of manufacturers in the world. Uh, so we would be uh, acquiring the chips from them, uh, the hardware, uh, which is the chip, the antenna that you see. So technically, I, let me correct myself, participants don't really see much of this system because it's almost transparent. Uh, the, for example, if you go on a road run, you will actually wear your race number. The chip actually is embedded onto the race number. So participants actually run with the race number. The chip follows them. They'll go through the start line. Go, they go through a split point. They go uh, to the end line. You'll be actually detected in this, this location. So to the participant, you don't see them. But this is where we know when the participant started, when they go through the split line, when they finish. Uh, if they don't go through the finish, or in a certain uh, event, we actually heard uh, participants don't even complete the whole race. They actually deviated, go to McDonald's or Mama Yam Cha. So uh, for us, we sort of would know because we will actually highlight back to or alert the organizer. Hey, um, some guys didn't come back. Do you know where they go? Uh, so these are the things that we do uh, with RFID timing system. Mm. In fact, RFID also can be quite uh, helpful for security reason when the runners go missing, unless they drop off the whole track. But... It'll be helpful to check, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, good to have you, Wei Xiang. I think we have we got two uh, relevant speakers for today's session. Um, I wish we could get more people, but you know, webinars can be a bit packed if there are too many speakers. Now, um, thank you to everybody who's watching in so far. It's uh, we've got uh, quite a number of people uh, following the webinars already. Uh, much obliged. Uh, continue sharing this webinar at your relevant Facebook pages. Uh, please leave a comments, and then we will be able to address your comments here. Uh, at about uh, maybe 2.45 to 3 o'clock, we will try to address some of the questions, if any. Now, uh, without further ado, now let's move into the topic. Now, um, CG, let's start with you. Maybe you can share with us uh, what is this phrase, mass participation, and maybe at the same time, you can share with us some general statistics uh, of sports events before the COVID-19. Uh, when I say stats, I'm talking about uh, how many events were held in 2019, for example? Uh, the kind of participants, it wasn't like 
100,000, 1 million people take part, blah, blah, blah. So number one, what is mass participation? Number two, the general stats for uh, mass participation events before COVID-19. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yeah, so maybe we take one step back and try to define what is sports events for, yeah. So sports events that generally can be, you know, divided into two uh, separate groups. One is a spectator sport, uh, spectator sporting event. One is a participative uh, sporting event. So spectator sporting is pretty uh, easy to understand. That's like MotoGP, Formula One, uh, football match that usually you go to watch the game. Somebody else is playing. So now that under the participating sport, uh, there are also two segments that we can classify. One is the elite participation, where you have the elite games, um, Olympics. Uh, you can have uh, a, a weekend competition between uh, national, state uh, representative, uh, a very limited number of people. Now, what we when we talk about mass participation, the other spectrum of sports where we get the public involved. So there is always more than. Uh, just the elite athletes as everybody who actually able to do the sport will sign up and participate with the sport um, and that is how we classify the group that we are uh, or we we represent which is the sports industry coalition where we talk about more of the mass participation type of sports yeah then you're talking about number of events we actually from uh, the sports coalition that we formed we actually gathered some information through uh, the organizers event owners uh, event registration portals uh, they were very um, outright and um, explained to us, explained to us the statistics available and what kind of uh, situation we had in 2019 versus 2020. As you know, 2019 was pretty much very normal. Uh, at that time, we were estimating to about 3,000 events a year. So you can imagine the whole year. That's so many weekends and only, but there is about 3,000 old events that happen in mass participation uh, grouping uh, settings. Yeah. And from that, we estimate about 4.2 million uh, participants uh, throughout the year of 2019. So that's pretty uh, big, I would say, because uh, you have different uh, events. You have triathlon, which is very limited number of people. Uh, you have cycling events, which also can be big and small. Uh, you have mass running, running events like the Standard Chartered Care Marathon. You can have 40, 50,000 people, the Penang Bridge Marathon. So that all add up to be about 4.2 million uh, participants in 2019, so uh, which is a very significant number, I guess. Yes, it is. It is. Now, CG, uh, interestingly, I picked up what you said just now. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ku and uh, I think a matter of disclosure, Mr. Ku and Mr. Lim are actually part of a sports industry coalition, which was initiated sometime in March this year by a gentleman by the name of Inche Ridwan. I think he was one of the uh, people who pushed for it. There's a third member of this, um, uh, the, the leaders of the uh, we call themselves SIC, Sports Industry Coalition. The third one is Azman, Azman uh, Fami, who can't make it today. So um, uh, maybe you can speak a little bit more about this uh, uh, Sports Industry Coalition. Wei Xiang, you want to talk a little bit? What is it about? What is the purpose before we go in further into the topic? All yeah, yours, sure. So the coalition came about in March 2021, as, as uh, how you said it, uh, Richard. Uh, but the journey is much, much longer. Uh, I still re uh, vividly remember when uh, I had this uh, conversation with um, uh, Azman's and, and, and Azman's boss somewhere in June last year, June 2020, that um, the mass participation industry been uh, quiet, we sort of uh, off the radar and um, nothing been happening. So, um, so there was the conversation where, hey, how do we go back to our industry that we are doing? Uh, which has been, uh, as what CG was saying, you know, we got 4.2 million participants, uh, close to 3,000 events in 2019, and came 2020 went quiet. So uh, the conversation started in June, uh, thinking hey, you know, among the few organizers whether they will have able to talk to each other, and uh, it went quiet for a while. And then uh, somewhere in September, this conversation brought up again uh, that they'll probably bring in different event, event organizers, big and small, um, not just for running, but also going to cycling, triathlons, uh, swimming or, or open water swim, for example. So, so that was the conversation in September. But then we, I think around the time we have our MCO 2.0 came around. And so all of us went quiet again. And until um, late February, uh, this is where this whole uh, point and topic being brought up again. And uh, this is where 
they we sort of start to spread the word around among our, our fellow friends and colleagues in, in the uh, mass participation industry that uh, it's about time for us to get together because uh, simply put it, we've been jobless since March 2020. And, and it's tough, literally yeah, yeah. because when there's no mass participation event means there's no job for us. So literally mm. all of us were jobless. And yeah. came February, uh, we managed to whip in and we brought in a um, few few guys and then from the few guys it actually grew up and, and it grew bigger and uh, I guess we have about uh, a, a hundred of us hundred over members yeah. yes 100 100 100 over companies us. inside the group yeah yeah so from there uh, in March I think that's where the sport industry coalition uh, sort of incepted where we the uh, intent where how do we sort of um, share our concern or, or even voice out, hey, this is our situation. Um, what what can we do? And 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 at least uh, I think instead of trying to speak to different ministries one by one, I think with the coalition, I think we were able to share the same. I think we are on the same wavelength. That what is our challenge, and um, how do we go forward from here? Yeah, in fact, um, I think it's safe for us to share with people that uh, this uh, the, the SIC the sports uh, people don't not to forget not to confuse the Sepang. So SIC, yeah. So the Sports Industry Coalition, the SIC Coalition, I call it the SIC Coalition, uh, have been conversing with the relevant ministry uh, to reopen the mass participation. But the timing has been unfortunate. And just when we are conversing with the uh, ministry, the numbers have gone up again. And um, I, I can see the look on Wei Xiang and CG like, you know, after all that effort, uh, so we're going to discuss about the SOP. I think uh, CG will be sharing with us how the SOP will be if we can reopen the mass participation. Okay, a good point. So on the point of jobless, can I just ask the two of you this question, maybe with CG first. CG, you know, how has the economic impact of this closure and uh, stopping of the events been on, I believe, thousands of people involved in the sports industry. CG, how, how's the impact on, for example, how's the impact has been on your company? Um, well, in the sense that because we are a mass participation sport, so even the manpower and resources needed to make it happen is pretty big. Yeah, For an event like Ironman, we need about um, 1,800 volunteers and crew uh, over a span of four or five days. Uh, bigger events in KL, Marathon and all, up to 2,000 volunteers a day. Um, so that is a very significant number of uh, people, especially for those in the gig economy, you know, the new term that we have learned over the last uh, couple of years. Um, and uh, based on the SIC members' feedback and updates on the, what they have actually gone through the last one year, um, in terms of events in 2019, we actually had uh, or employed up to about almost close to 300,000 uh, full-time, uh, part-time crew, volunteers, uh, resources that we use like security guards over the weekend. Uh, that's like a very significant um, hiring and manpower workforce that we have actually. So, and all that were jobless as well, you know, technically in the last uh, one year because there was no events to go to. Hmm, what a... Thousands of lives, and many people don't realize uh, uh, yeah. that, oh, you know, just, just stop the marathon, just stop the cycling. Yes, yes, we understand the fear. We totally, I mean, I especially, I, I just don't try to totally avoid the virus. Uh, yeah. Massive impact on my law firm if we get the virus. But the fact Correct. remains, is it does impact on the jobs, right? A lot of people lost yes. their jobs. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. like, for instance, job, just want to elaborate further as well. Uh, there are many tiers of uh, workforce that we impact or industries that we impact. Yeah. So the first line is like us, we are the organizer event owner. The second tier is like Wei Xiang or Ku. He's actually our service provider. But then, uh, let's say multi-tier of, sorry, different types of service provider in the same tier. They also have another provider that support them and provide them the raw material, uh, the services they need to make their services to provide for us. So when one thing don't happen is the domino effect uh, and the whole chain of supply chain actually affected. So um, yeah. the government look at it that way uh, as one full industry. They look at us as one individual sport element, but they forgot that you know we are interdependent with everybody and a different tier of the business structure. 
So like, cool, he's waiting for me to have an event. I don't have an event, doesn't have a job. Then Ku is waiting, his crew under, under championship is also waiting for a job. But yeah. he doesn't have an event, doesn't have a job to hire them. So that's a lot of uh, interdependency within the structure and the uh, whole business ecosystem, which the government to look at as a whole is looking at the one layer and the layer at the same time. So yeah. that's actually something that uh, they should uh, focus on a little bit more in our industry. Yes, yes. In fact, I can share before I go to Wei Xiang, uh, on my personal note, uh, I'm an amateur runner, notwithstanding how fat I am, but I'm an amateur. <laughs> so we walk. My wife and I take on uh, the, the 10 kilos most of the time. Uh, mm. 10 kilometers, uh, not, ten, 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 not 10 kilo of food, but 10 kilos. <laughs> but I realized that because we don't run now, we don't do our carbo diet before, which means no pasta and all that. Then no, you're, still loading, right? you're still doing carbo loading every day. No workout, exactly. Then, then, you know, our visits to all the sport shops have dropped. Uh, you know, last time before everyone will buy this, buy that, you know, get this yes. tape, uh, that tape, then uh, uh, the foot massage after the run, the makan after the run, all zero. You know, exactly. so just uh, an amateur runner alone, I, I stop all these other businesses. So the impact is horrible. What about you, Wei Maybe hmm. you can share with us. Uh, yes, you, you mentioned about job. But what about the, uh, what you observe, your observation uh, uh, about the impact of the total stoppage of events on the, uh, the secondary business? Let's call it the secondary business of sports yeah. events. Um, the impact, well, um, close to my heart would be uh, my guys, my crew who have been with us for, for years and um, they were, off and on they would just drop me a text. Uh, hey, we say, uh, any event coming, you know, what's the light, uh, when this event may come again, uh, when the door will start, restart, you know, uh, big scale, we miss all the big scale events, we miss uh, waking up uh, three in the morning or even uh, one in the morning to get to an event. Uh, so this are things that um, the, interestingly uh, the guys miss because um, is the fun that we do uh, even though there's uh, a lot of uh, stress involved with it uh, I always say the, the I always use this analogy uh, when event is at the size of say um, in a good old days 5,000 participants and when the event grew by three times the size say 15,000 participants everything is multiplied by three uh, the load of participants coming back to you is times three uh, things to go wrong is three times faster uh, but this is the things that we enjoy doing it on, on, on the weekend per, per weekend basis uh, yeah. but now this is all gone um, the yeah. impact to them is they actually have to they do I mean some of them do have their own normal day job but the thing is, these are things that the, the skills that they pick up over the years, the things that they, 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 they enjoy or um, fine tune over the years of how to do things better and stuff like that. And now they have no place to, to, to use it or even to, to expand it. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this topic today is not intended to uh, demand or press or push for an immediate restart for mass participation sports. <clears throat> I think the timing is uh, insensitive if you push for it, uh, particularly since it's a fasting month. You know, the, So in fact, it's the other way around, ladies and gentlemen. We purposely held this during the fasting month because we know this is not the time for us to take part. We just want to discuss this matter. The reason mm -hmm. why we started this uh, webinar today is to uh, offer a platform for people like uh, Mr. Ku Wei Siang, Mr. C. G. Lim, and if he, he could make it in Chi Azman uh, to come in and share their views uh, so that this will go on record uh, and then we can share this video with other viewers that hey guys uh, mass participation sport is not just about cycling there are a lot of other people affected by it um, uh, so moving on from there uh, uh, we now know that sharing direct evidence from the two of you um, that there is uh, a direct impact on the economic well-being of this industry uh, and down uh, from the top, the organizer, all the way down to the end uh, vendor, everybody is suffering. Now, what about uh, moving on from this? Do you know? If, do you have any comments about sports tourism? Because I heard uh, CG mentioned just now about you know Iron Man being a bit of tourism. In fact, I know like the the massive our uh, our standard chartered uh, run and all that. You know, we attract. Hundreds of people overseas flying in to take part 
uh, our cycling events i know people from uh, singapore comes in to take part uh, especially if it's held in joho blah 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 cg do you think uh, obviously there's an impact on tourism isn't it that means the hotels are also suffering isn't it yeah i mean for sure the different different size of event different type of events have different uh number of uh, international uh, but we don't talk even on international with let's talk about domestic wise to tourism wise you, you have events in kl but you have people from penang and Johor coming to kl i uh, still need a place to stay they still uh, come here they eat they do shop before they get back or we go to Johor to race example so there is a lot of um, tourism factors even for uh, domestic wise so we did a study with the within the sic members on how much of economy impact we actually have in the gdp of a country uh, especially when there are good times uh, like 2019 uh, we actually came up with a number based on the expenditure of the organizers within all different layers of uh, uh, expenses um, we also look into the domestic tourism uh, value and international tourism value based on the multiplier by tourism Malaysia. We actually even discounted their multipliers, yeah, because we we thought maybe uh, sport events like this will probably do a, a, a one night trip or day trip the most. So we we did that multiplier. We came out in twenty nineteen. Uh, our industry actually contributed uh, at least one point three billion in terms of the economy impact. Uh, to the country. So that is actually discounting smaller events in the, maybe the East Coast or East Malaysia, which we don't know about, uh, that do have smaller scale events coming in. Uh, maybe some uh, trail runs, you know, that they have uh, participants from all over Malaysia coming to run, but it's not really um, a, a massive online registration of event. They have uh, a smaller uh, clique of people who understand the event. So doing that, they actually, uh, we add up maybe could be even more than 1.5 or 1.3 billion uh, in economy impact now that's significant for an economy uh, for industry itself yeah uh, industry that people think uh, people don't even care about it right now uh, but contributes out to 1.3 billion or more uh, to the economy of malaysia so uh, a case point like for instance uh, i'm malaysia i'm in malaysia in langkawi is actually uh, a tourism centric of uh, event so we have like mentioned 65 to 70 percent uh, international athletes but even domestic athletes have to go to Langkawi to, uh, to race, right? So technically, it's all sports tourism within the island. Uh, based on 2019's number, when we did a study with the state of Kedah, uh, we generated about 32 million, 30 to 32 million uh, ringgit uh, in the span of five days in tourism value. Uh, that's actually all the expenditure, hotels, um, what they, they do there, rent a car, you know, go for um, windsurfing and all the stuff. So it ended up about 31 million. That's a lot for one that's weekend. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that is excluding excluding uh, flight ticket booking because we have no idea where they come from, right? Yeah. That's excluding the SSD that they pay for all the expenses that they, they uh, the products mm. they buy, right? Uh, outside of Langkawi, for instance, they come to, when they fly to Langkawi, they do not just fly directly to Langkawi, they land in KL. Uh, maybe they take a couple of days off in Penang or KL just to um, uh, have a holiday before they go back. Uh, we've known athletes who come uh, at least uh, a week before the event and stay a week after the event to really visit Malaysia. So that itself is a very significant number, a very significant impact to the economy. Uh, but of course, yeah. that all this in 2020. Unfortunately, yeah. Again, I, I raised a question, CG, because I really want people to uh, hear from the horse's mouth uh, what sports event do. In my view, sports event is not just a place for people to be healthy or strive to be healthy but sports event actually make the economy healthy uh the amount of sports event we have and as you know just clang valley itself every week there is a sport event or was having a sports event every week um so now without that total zero you can imagine the impact on the entire economy it is massive. Yeah, exactly. Massive. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think Stephanie just pointed out also a very good, uh, good point as well. Uh, besides the 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 impact to the economy itself, the mental health as well as physical well-being of uh, athletes, whether you are a weekend warrior or you are full-time <coughs> state athlete, uh, it's it's all the same. You know, when competition is not available or a point to compare your performance uh, benchmark between an athlete and another athlete. Uh, that causes a lot of uh, mental fatigue. Um, people give up, you know. 
uh, it goes into a, a state of like a semi depression where they are just too fed up. You know, like I'm an athlete for a whole year, they've been trying to train and trying to race, but nothing to race. There's no yeah. way to participate in a race. Yeah. So they get yeah. very tired and they get very exhaustive, uh, exhausted with the whole process that they just ah, forget it. You know, I'll just do something else and I'll move on. Yeah. Uh, so that's so very bad. Um, on the other one, I just want to point out quickly as well. In 2019, there was a study about uh, obesity in Malaysia. You know, uh, we are mm. famous for 24 hours food before COVID. <laughs> yeah, you can get food anywhere, anytime. Yeah, um, and uh, we we saw like make that a culture in our life. So 50% of the adults in Malaysia are obese. Yeah, and uh, out of them, 80% of the young kids in Malaysia are obese. The overweight mm. are obese. That's scary, you know, to think of it. And uh, we just went one through one year of uh, sitting in front of a laptop, uh, not going to class, not going to exercise, no competition to go to. Um, state swimmers, state runners, can't do anything, but just sit at home and yeah. continue to cover load. Yeah. So, Richard, you've been doing that. So, <laughs> but that becomes a problem for all of us because then um, the whole um, economy, the whole well being of uh, the community, just goes down yeah so and uh, and we still can't get it up back yeah so there's no yeah. way for us to jump start it so and it's going to be harder for us to pick up the pace and jump start it back if we do not have a gradual uh, reopening or, or a re rethink of process on how to start this again by the time. yeah i agree i agree good point here by steven uh, gomez uh, it creates a togetherness and creates a stress-free environment Unless you are at the last, uh, unless you are last, but anyway, you create a stress-free <laughs> environment. Uh, but there, I agree with uh, Stephen. That is true indeed. Now, um, so okay, let's let's now move on to uh, um, the 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 sports industry coalition again. Maybe Wei Xiang, um, you can take the lead here, and that uh, CG mm. come in. I know for a fact uh, the SIC coalition has been speaking with the ministry. Uh, subject to whatever privacy that you may have with the relevant officers of the Ministry of Youth and Sports. Uh, maybe you can share with us, number one, what have you been pursuing as mm. part of the coalition? What have you been pursuing with the minister, with the government? And maybe a CG, I know I've done this. Maybe later you can share the proposed standard operating procedure. Uh, mm. We've seen runs happening in Vietnam. We've seen runs happening in Shanghai. We have seen cycling events restarting around the world again. Uh, how are we going to do it in Malaysia? Even after we receive our vaccine, how are we going to receive it? So, starting with Wei number one, tell us about or share with us about SIC's uh, articulation and mm. advocacy with the ministry. And later on, CG can come in with the what? Uh, okay, we're going to start it, but how? How are we going to do it? All yours, Wei Xiang? Sure. Um, just, just before I, I go on to that, um, the SIC. Well, just to continue the part we were talking about the SIC, uh, when we started the SIC or when the SIC come together, so uh, we were very surprised because um, as of now, we have about 77 companies which is on the uh, member list of the SIC. And in the member list, it's a mix of event organizers, uh, vendors, suppliers in the mass participation industry. And for the longest time, never before or any one of us were actually in the same uh, pool or in the same group. And, and we are pursuing the same objective, which is uh, to the betterment of the sports and the area of mass participation. So with that said, the group got together and we were actually trying to um, sort of uh, articulate the message to um, the ministries, uh, spe specifically KBS, uh, on the ground saying, uh, what would be the concern? Uh, from the uh, KBS and also the other ministries, namely like the health ministry or even the uh, um, safety ministries uh, in, in regards of mass participation opening and uh, what would be the uh, concern and also how do we able to address concern because it's going to be a, a mix from both parties, which is the organizers and the members of the uh, SIC coalition and also from the government ministries. So this is where we need to find uh, where the balance is going to be so that, uh, number one, we, don't, we, we need to have the industry to able to reopen in a gradual manner. But then that also should not be leading towards to uh, another outbreak, another spike or another new clusters. So these are things that we need to be very, very sensitive on where um, 
get the industry open, but with a set of conditions. So I think this is where um, the, the, the point coming from KBS itself, uh, they also know that they have a certain set of SOP that they also would like uh, the public and also the event organizers to, to follow and, and able to bring forward so that when the day comes, the mass participation is allowed to open, then these things, guidelines and the protocol will be there in place so that um, we will not restart another uh, industry, but restart also another cluster. Yeah, um, that that is a concern. <laughs> we don't want to start another cluster. So ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Mr. Ku has mentioned, uh, if I can expand a little bit before I go to CG, uh, there are two layers in the uh, sports industry coalition. The first layer is uh, getting getting everybody involved uh, and I think we gain uh, feedback of about 100 over companies. I think about 120, 100. I stand corrected uh, where they we gather this group. Then as Mr. Ku mentioned correctly, there were 70 over members who became part of a memorandum of understanding. So we yep. created a MOU. There's no association. So we created the MOU where the MOU is a binding document to uh, uh, collect all these 70 over companies. And uh, from the force of these 70 over companies, uh, the force of uh, authority, Mr. Ku, uh, Mr. Lim, and Mr. Azman uh, approached the ministry. And so far, I think they are uh, willing to speak with you, right? As we, you mentioned just now, Vaisyam. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Now, uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe I'll come back to you later, Vaisyam. CG, sure. okay, we're going to start the event. And I'm sure when you and Vaisyam went to speak to the ministry, they're going to ask you that magical question. Okay, bro, kita buka macam mana? You want to open, so how? They will ask you the magical question. So what do you say to them? How are we going to do these events and respect the SOP? Maybe you can share with us part of it. Yeah, sure, Ken. Uh, just to elaborate further on what uh, uh, Ku was trying to also articulate is that at this point of time, we can't push forward uh, immediate reopening of uh, the whole industry yeah, uh, because the numbers are increasing and uh, something that we cannot control. We were praying that the numbers would go down. It went down actually at the point to most 900 people. And we were actually pushing hard at the time to restart at, at least smaller scale of events in Malaysia so that the industry can start rolling. Uh, but with the number that's increasing, uh, all we can is to pray that numbers come down soon. Uh, the other thing is that when the numbers do come down soon, and when the do, numbers do come down, we do plead to the government that don't forget us again. You know, we are around, we are here, and uh, we are a big industry, and we are a lot of people with a lot of different layers of industry helping uh, just the mass participation events. And uh, ours should be the first priority to reopen. So now how do we reopen this uh, industry? The idea that we actually put forward to KBS in the last meeting about four weeks ago, uh, we actually presented to them uh, a small number of reopening with a very strict um, SOP in the beginning. Uh, for instance, like uh, we have a uh, different type of uh, way for flag off, flag off. Uh, we have separation of uh, participants in groups, so they come different timing. Uh, when they start uh, into the start pan, we do take the temperature uh, and to make sure that they are not having a fever or no symptoms before they start the, uh, the race. And uh, when they are in the start line to queue, they are wearing their masks. Uh, just before flag off, they take off their mask and throw it in the bin and they can run. So when we release in batches, uh, the whole route would be more uh, spread out in terms of uh, number of participants rather than they all clustered together uh, in, in previous days when we have missed start. Yeah? So by doing that, we're able to physically distance some of them so that they're able to continue to race and come back. Now, those, a few things also as well, we talked about, uh, example, uh, water station. We do want to uh, get some of these uh, participants to be a little bit more self-sufficient, maybe bring your own hydration back. Uh, and only if we run out of water, there is some backup water where we supply in the water station. Uh, when you come to the finish line, uh, it's a no frill finish line for a start. You come back, you get your medal, you get your finisher shirt, and uh, we see you, thank you, we see you next year. You go to your car and go home. Yeah, we try to avoid people gathering as well. So we put security around try to uh, avoid um, athletes or runners uh, sit down and, and try to share their war stories of the whole journey. Uh, we want them to go home and disperse from the location as fast as possible. And I think, you know, we're talking to so many athletes um, who have been hungry to go back to events. Understand these SOPs. They, they believe 
that they have to adhere to it and uh, otherwise they get clamped down again, yeah if you don't follow the sop we're going to get clamped down you're going to be back to square one so i believe we can in our honor and our side you know to honor this uh, sop and uh, whatever restrictions the government give it to us we do to the best we can and to make this happen uh, so that we do not create another cluster but we can still revitalize the industry and make it uh, you know rolling again so with the mm. last discussion we had four weeks ago with, the, uh, with kbs was very fruitful actually they understood our problem uh, they also came out with similar type of uh, sop guidelines and we had a very uh, fruitful dialogue and uh, share we shared opinions on how it should be done and as far as we know uh, this uh, so-called uh, draft sop has been passed on to mkn side uh, it's been sitting on mkn for the last uh, almost four weeks now and uh, we're still waiting for MKN to make the final decision to announce the reopening. Uh, all the pillars of sports within KBS has reopened. Ours is actually the last one uh, that is still closed at this point of time. Yeah, quite, uh, quite. Uh, I mean, of course, at this very second, it'll be insensitive to ask for the yeah. push for it. But I do find it strange that uh, as a matter of comparison, we are allowed to have schools reopen and now we can see clusters create you know, coming out of schools. In fact, one of my uh, friend, very close friend's daughter, got tested positive. He's furious that a fourteen-year-old girl, <laughs> for no reason, got 14. tested. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, in UK, for example, in England, uh, all schools, the NHS, the National Health Service of England, they go to the schools every three, four days to test the kids. Every three, four days to test the kids. Mm -hmm. Here, nothing. Then we have, uh, as you know, the infamous story about Pasamalam is open, uh, and we need the Pasamalam. By the way, I'm not here to. <laughs> I'm not asking the Pasar Malam to close. The pa Pasar Malam guys are people like Wei Siang also. You know, they, they have business, like UCG, they have business. They need to yes. open all the they bankrupt and mati. They all. So yeah. yeah, I'm all for uh, supporting the industry and allowing people to open. But it's strange yeah. like, that we can allow Pasar Malam to open. Now we've got the Ramadan Bazaar open. But we still cannot create a <laughs> sporting yeah. event. You know, and uh, so it's the same. It's the same analogy that what we're trying to advocate as well. If you can open the shopping malls, I don't. Let's let's look into the shopping mall where it's a closed environment, air conditioned, uh, very closed space when you go to a shop. But there are SOPs been established to do that. Yeah. So like number of people allowed inside a shop, number of people allowed into a certain space, um, that can be applied into events as well. So yeah, we, we, that's that's how we are fighting our argument or maybe putting forward our our dialogue and saying that hey, you know, you can do that, we can that do that as well in our events, and uh, it shouldn't be a problem to restart uh, the mass participation events. But of course, in in gradual steps, not going forty thousand at one time, even one thousand at one time. Maybe we go smaller numbers so that at least we are also building confidence in the community that we are safe. Uh, the, the event owners like me do not want to bear responsibility of creating another cluster. Uh, we yeah. are controlling the numbers and then we get, we get more confident in understanding how things evolve. Maybe KBS also can rediscuss and say, oh, the numbers now can increase the different limit, a different limit. Yeah? Yeah. So that, but the door needs to be open first. Now the door is tight closed. It's been closed for 13 months now. And uh, we, we do not have even have an opportunity to get a, a small opening for us to try. Uh, to, to start with, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wei Xiang, you want to add on to that? Maybe anything you want to share? Maybe about risk management, about insurance, anything you want to add on? Well, yeah, I think um, the component just adding on to to CG's uh, comment, which is uh, the industries could need to go through a re full recalibration. So we we can't be doing how things we were doing back in two zero one nine and the years before. Uh, there's a lot of recalibration, even like now, our experience of going into a mall, going to someone's office is to totally changed. So likewise, similar back into uh, mass participation, um, that whole journey of going into a, the event, the whole component will change. Uh, in adding that, uh, I think the, the elements of, um, like, like you mentioned, the insurance, um, the areas where the uh, safety of the participants, I think that is all the things that uh, the component that uh, should not be taken lightly. I think that that is the area where um, it, it plays a very, very uh, vital component for, for us in, in this sports itself because number one uh, is the name it is, uh, mass participation. There's a lot of people involved and um, these are things that we cannot discount. So um, the sports always have uh, very bad lights. Or we, we encounter bad lights here and there 
where uh, certain things happen and then when someone investigate deeper and they realize, oh, certain things was not done, certain things was not highlighted, certain things was not taken into consideration. So these are the things where um, we, we have learned through all this um, bad moment, um, but we also should take this lesson to go forward to, a, to be a betterment so that we don't repeat them again. So be it from, uh, like you said, uh, insurance or even the uh, National Sports Association. So there's a lot of uh, cohesiveness where all these bodies and, and even like SIC would able to see where do we find a common ground. Because in the end of the day, uh, we are all in the same arena, which is in the sports, be it mass participation or even elite. And um, if, we came, if we are in working in a silo manner, I don't think... We're still going to repeat the same thing how we were doing before. And, and, and with this light of COVID, uh, I would say this is the best time for us to recalibrate ourselves and take this opportunity where we are not having a massive event, 3,000 event crammed into uh, 52 weekends. Now is the best time for everyone to come aboard and say, hey, now is the time to make something out of this, redefine the, the, what we need to recalibrate. I think that will be the, the, the point that I'm, I will be looking at. Mm. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well said, Wei Xiang. So, we've heard, ladies and gentlemen, so far, where uh, CG have uh, shared with us a proposed SOP. I like it where, uh, so basically for now, we're going to start, if we can start, uh, the mass participation event, it be the smaller mass participation events. And for running and cycling events, I think there'll be a staggered start. Uh, I suppose we'll start running at 4 a.m. now, even for 5 km. Um, but it's a good way. And I, I like how you say that uh, mask on, run, mask off, and then run, finish, mask on again. And basically, once you finish running, go home. You know, yes. <laughs> go home, right? Uh, but you get to run. You can take part. You get, get the exercise and build up for that. And I like what Wei Xiang said, uh, to summarize it, that we have to relook at the way we live our life. So we need to also relook at the way we run our sports events. Um, so that's uh, that's something about the issues of recalibration. So well, well said, Wei Xiang. Now, um, moving on, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, I do have uh, some questions here, but before I go to the questions, CG Wei Xiang, is there anything else you want to add on before I address one or two questions here? CG, you're mute, CG. Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. I just want to add that uh, technically, you know, even though there's just two of us here uh, talking to you, uh, we want to just really uh, say thanks to the members of the SIC coalition that, you know, really put together and be frontal with us with all their needs and, and, and also the data that we have. Uh, because uh, like what Wei Xiang uh, mentioned earlier, uh, that I probably there was never a time where all competitors with different, uh, you know, same events, different competitors. We are all competitors in our own right. Uh, we'll, ne we'll never be seen to sit down together and agree on something. So, yeah. I mean, kudos to all the organizers, event owners, uh, subcontract, subcontract service mm -hmm. providers and all to be able to understand that we have to put our differences aside uh, for the better good, yeah? For the, the purpose of reopening this sector that we so, so depend on. Uh, all of us are really running low on cash flow. Uh, there is not much of support from the government in terms of all the prihatin packages and all. Uh, we did a survey within our 77 members as well. A very limited number of people actually got any benefit from any of the uh, wage subsidy or prihatin loans and all. And even loans, um, uh, as Asman has mentioned to some of uh, the media interviews as well, uh, if you go to the bank right now as an event owner, you're trying to borrow money, yeah? Any banks in Malaysia, be it international or local bank. The quest first question they'll ask you is that uh, the events are not started, so how do you plan to repay this? So there's no way for a company like our business to really go and try to ask for money to support our operations. Uh, neither can the packages in Prihatin and government and all uh, be able to utilize in our events. So to reopen quickly uh, as soon as we can, so that we are able to restart and survive, you know, uh, that's very, very important. But again, thank you uh, to all the members in the SIC, you know, really appreciate. Uh, we're just representative of your voices, uh, but, you know, hopefully the government hears us and uh, open up whatever we need. Yeah, but from what I can see, uh, CG, in fact, my uh, personal feedback that I received from the Ministry of Youth and Sports, I think the ministry is all in support to reopen 
the mass participation sport. So kudos to the KBS. They understand uh, the, yep. uh, the uh, negative impact uh, of this on, on all of you. Uh, but unfortunately, we have to you know respect the numbers and the majlis keselamatan negara, which we many of us don't know how how it works and how it worked there. But that's another matter. Uh, that yeah. that that yeah, we are waiting for that ministry. Or in fact, they're not even ministry. They it's just a majlis uh, to you know to to serve us out there. Okay, uh, moving on. Um, uh, I, in fact, yeah, CG, on the on the point that you mentioned, in my career as a as a sports lawyer, this is the first time I see some of you on the same platform. Uh, yeah. Sometimes when I do end up discussing with the sports industry, even I am careful. God, I know that if I speak to Mister A, Mister A and Mister X are not talking to each other because they are, they are rivals. Yeah. Now Mister A and Mister X are in the same WhatsApp groups. So very, very interesting to see that. Yeah, yeah. but. Well done. You know, you know what's the big picture. So let's let's move on from there. Now uh, there are some. There's one question here. Maybe both uh, uh, Wei Xiang and uh, uh, CG can answer. Somebody asked about how to join the SIC. Hang on. Um, ah yes, from David. David Spence uh, asked this question. Thank you, David. Many great points about the scale of the MPE business uh, and the domino effect. Uh, thank you so much for raising that. I'm uh, mentioning that. How can others get involved in the SIC and help progress the footprint? Yes, to revitalize MPs. Maybe Wei Xiang, you can start first. Um, well, number one, we don't collect membership fee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, I, I think probably you can get in touch with us offline. Uh, we, we would love to uh, welcome more uh, people, more voice in the group, uh, more angles of story or more um, areas of um, challenge that you're facing. So from there, we will actually bring in to the group in this coalition and uh, we actually have a different, more angle to what is the coalition going to go forward from, from there. Uh, I think... Um, Top line, I think um, any one of us, CG or even myself, uh, we, we, are, we are searchable uh, on social media and uh, we can actually bring on from there. Yeah, actually, uh, thanks, uh, I forgot one more thing. Actually, we'd like to yeah. thank Rich, uh, Richard Wee as well uh, from yeah. RWC for yeah. giving his time uh, to be our pro bono lawyer. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, just to support us in the sense of uh, understanding the aspect. He's not on contract or anything like that with us. So he's just giving his private time to help us to structure this properly. Uh, but of course, if anybody who is interested to be part of this SIT, you can reach out to me, myself or maybe uh, email to Richard as well. Uh, then we can put you into part of the MOU. Um, as we, I think we saw mentioned as well, the more voice together, together is a stronger voice we, we have, yeah, will be. Yeah, much obliged for that, uh, CJ. Just, uh, I love sports and uh, I would hate it to see fellow sports uh, people uh, not doing well. Uh, so just uh, just doing this out of our love. Um, so now, um, going on, there's, a, um, there's one point here also from David. David asked a lot of good questions. How feasible <laughs> would it be to bring in rapid lateral flow tests to Malaysia to add even greater confidence on event safety so uh any of you want to try this uh thank you david uh, great to see you there yeah so maybe i i take this on because we did talk about it uh within the group as well how about doing rtk and degen tests as well uh before the test or how about ensuring somebody else have a pcr result before they come for uh for the race i think it's a little bit difficult but of course we are also subjected to kkm or moh uh, requirements of testing uh, if testing is required, then, you know, uh, MICE events, people who go to MICE events, conferences, exhibition, also need to be tested. Um, but it's not the case right now. Uh, so we do need to follow the guidelines of MOH. Now, whether the lateral uh, flow test is uh, good or not, uh, it's still uh, in a testing stage in UK. Of course, UK is really advocating this lateral flow test. It's really interesting to see. Uh, efficacy or in terms of accuracy is still about 40%. Uh, but I don't think that solves any problems in terms of reopening. I, I guess it's not about what tests you have done or whether you are vaccinated or not before we can open. Uh, even though you are not vaccinated, I think there's a way for us to control within the SOP guidelines 
uh, to be uh, safe and proper yeah, within that whole operation. Otherwise, we cannot open pasar, we cannot open shopping mall, we can open school if you don't have that proper SOP, so whether you're vaccinated or not. Yeah, so, but it was a good, good point there, uh, David. In fact, um, uh, uh, my personal view, of course, this is subject to cost and subject to budget, uh, and provided the insurance industry is able to step in and make it far more affordable for all the sports events, I feel that the sports event in the future should acquire a reasonable insurance coverage uh, so in case anybody unfortunately contracted the COVID uh, uh, purportedly through this event, then the insurance can cover some of the costs. Uh, that, that would be one. But of course, all this is moving forward in future, something to uh, risk management. As um, I think the other day, CG, you remember many weeks ago, we had, a, what, uh, we had a video call of all the participants and one of the SIC participants asked me, whether they, we can manage the risk management. So while I'm not an insurance agent, but uh, as a lawyer, we can uh, try to, you know, propose that idea. Uh, but you think you can afford that, CJ? I mean, can, can we pass that cost to the participant? Uh, unfortunately, we may have to do that. Yeah, so similar to other mm -hmm. events as launched, some of these SOP costs that the government imposed to us will increase the cost of events. Uh, that's for sure. I mean, nobody can hide around it. Uh, and we have estimated to cost about 20-30% increase depending on the scale of the event. So the question asked is that uh, what kind of risk we can mitigate on this? Uh, there's also two sides, you know, participants and event organizers needs to understand the risk involved. So participants need to be uh, accountable for what risk they bring to the event. Event organizers do their best uh, to do the, within the SOP that's given by the government to ensure that the risk is controlled. Uh, so that we at least we can have a safe event together. Yep. You know, ladies and gentlemen, those who have been inquiring about uh, being part of the SIC coalition, or even just, uh, you know, being part of the larger group, we call it the larger group who's not in the uh, uh, MOU. I repeat, those who are part of the MOU are 77 or about 80 members. <coughs> uh, 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 and then there's a larger group of 100 old people also in the group. Um, so if you're interested to sign up, uh, look for Inche Azman Fami, uh, Inche Ku, Mr. Ku Siang. Look for his Facebook page. It's obviously, he's on Facebook because he's here. And uh, Mr. C.G. Lim. Uh, C.G. Lim is easy. La. Just look for Iron Man. You can find him, you know. <laughs> uh, and then, or you can just uh, send a direct message on Richard B. Chambers uh, on this very Facebook page where you're on. Just click and tell us who you uh, who you are. Then uh, my my colleagues in the IT part will capture your email and send to uh, Wei Xiang, C.G. or Azman. But I would encourage more companies to come in uh, because not only will it help you now, uh, but moving forward in future, it is a far better um, platform mm. when it's a united front as opposed to a fragment, defragmentized uh, group. Um, so I, I, I hope all more, more sports people come in. Huh? Okay, now, um, uh, we're, well, it's almost three o'clock. We've got already addressed some of the questions. The rest are, are nice comments from the viewers. Thank you very much for your positive comments. Uh, we have Rainer. <laughs> uh, lots of runs forwarded registration to 2021. How to charge again? <laughs> so for those who don't know Mr. Rainer, I hope I pronounce his name correctly. Don't call me later. He's the man behind the stand chart run, isn't it, CG? Yeah, KL Stanley yeah, yes. Chatter. KL Stanley Chatter. The man. The man, yeah. The man, yeah. So, uh, and I take part in his run every year. Now, I finally get to know him. So, um, yeah. So, there you go. Uh, then, we have a comment here from uh, Putra Zul, uh, who said that uh, the problem is with the increasing numbers of cases. I guess it would be difficult for the National Security Council to keep green light. And another thing is with all the numbers announced every day, it is not clear on the data where and when contributed uh, to the four-figure daily and our vaccination progress is too slow. In fact, Putra, thanks for raising this. You know, um, uh, I, I want to say this, um, uh, Putra, I totally agree with that because I, I'd always wonder, right, CG, uh, Wei Xiang, yep. where, did, where did these thousands of people come from every day? Who, who are these people? As in, where are they? Where did they get the disease from? Where did they get the virus from? Then, then isn't that better once we know where they came from? So I understand, for example, before this, there was a cluster for factory. But MKN said, no, 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 we, we can't close the factory because of economy. 
But then, what about people running the Ironman and uh, championship? So, this industry can kaput, but the factory cannot close. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand that, that data reading, you know, by, by our, with respect to our government. Uh, and then, you know, I don't want to be seen that I, I am the opposition. You know, sometimes you comment, oh, this guy is... Open. I'm just questioning as a rakyat, how do we decide, isn't it? Uh, I know CG Aviation will be difficult for you to answer. So, <laughs> being independent, let me say it. Uh, okay. I will be the one who say that. Like, how? Why is it that we can open Pasar Malam, but we can't open... I, I just don't understand the data. Lah. So, we need that. Uh, uh, yeah. So, I think CG and Vesha just smile and Enough mm-hmm. lah. So, okay. Now, um, moving on to wrap up the topic, maybe I can invite uh, Wei Xiang first. Uh, is there anything you want to summarize and wrap up for before we uh, call this a day? And then I, I will also summarize for everybody. All yours, Wei Xiang? Sure. Um, just very short one. Um, it's just back to uh, uh, upholding personal SOP. Uh, you know, um, our KKM have a set of SOP. Uh, MCAN has set of SOP to follow. But in the end of the day, every one of us has the individual personal SOP we need to follow. Sanitize your hand, wash your hand, wear your mask. I think that is the, the, the main basic uh, things that we should not take in lightly and should not lapse. Um, recalibration will be the thing to go forward. I think that that is the the thing that uh, what we learned in the last thirteen months, where uh, a lot of things need to be recalibrated and also um, upholding our personal SOP. I think that that is the main main component that we should not let go. Yeah, thanks. We totally agree with you. Yep. Um, great great reminder that we tend to forget about that. Yeah. Uh, CG, uh, maybe you want to summarize from your angle. Um. Uh... Yeah, I, I truly agree with what we said. Um, I think it's all the responsibility of ours. Uh, it's our own responsibility to make sure that the uh, SOP are followed so that we do not have a bigger number suddenly come up, like what Richard said, don't know from where. Uh, it's just to ensure that we are abiding to the SOP so that uh, the situation will be better and then we have a stronger argument or stronger uh, case to build uh, with KMKN to reopen this business. Yeah, as what Mr. Wan Yudong has mentioned, he's also, we call him the otai of the industry, uh, the, the person or the man who understands the whole industry better than all of us. Uh, it is an ongoing effort uh, within this SIC. It's just the start, yeah? It's just the journey has just begun. We haven't got anywhere yet. We have got our one foot in into KBS, uh, but we're still finding and grouping our ways into MKN, uh, into maybe even SMB minister. Uh, just to help maybe the small, medium scale industry like us, uh, maybe some support and how we can uh, survive through these uh, difficult times. So uh, be with us. I mean, uh, we, we know that this journey is going to be a little bit longer, not as quick as we thought it would be. Uh, we also only committed ourselves for three months to get this done, uh, but it looks like it's going to be a, a little bit longer. So Yeah, we may have to extend the MOU, yeah. <laughs> really hoping and praying that the government opens up and understand the plight that we have and maybe we can be re-invited to discuss. Well, we are always open to dialogue, yeah? I mean, uh, putting our name in front to the government so that they understand there is a party they can call, uh, be it three of us or any of the race organizers to bring along and, uh, and have a chat with the government to understand what they are concerned on, uh, on so they can, you know, justify the concern, maybe find a way to also mitigate the risk between both parties so that we can reopen, yeah? Either way, we are open to discuss. I think that's the purpose we, we, we form this, not to sit down and wait for things to happen, yeah? Yeah. Well, take action, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Typical of oh, take the action. <laughs> talk, uh, talk is cheap, work better. Yeah, action is better. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me just quickly summarize. Number one, there's a massive impact of the closure or stopping of the sports event, uh, work loss of job, people like Wei Xiang, the secondary business are totally, uh, you know, er- er- erased, you know. And then there's a third layer of businesses, the food massage, the, the pasta maker, all suffering. Then uh, there is the impact of the uh, tourism industry, as we mentioned. People forget about that, that, the, that every sports event actually re- uh, generate lots of income for the tourism. Then there is the uh, SOP, uh, uh, CG. So are, these people, are, the people in this industry are not just complaining. They are they're actually trying to find a solution and the solution has been provided. Uh, and it works. It works in other countries. It can work here. 
And uh, also, moving on, uh, those who are interested to uh, join the Sports Industry Coalition, the SIC Coalition, please contact Wei Xiang or CG or you can send a direct message to the RWC group. And you just heard a summary from the two speakers. Can I invite everybody here to give a cyber round of applause to Mr. Ku and Mr. Lim? You know, they spend, uh, you know, when I ask them to do this uh, webinar, they said, sure, let's do it. You know, and then typical of, uh, I think CG would have done his usual 10 kilometer run and thinking how to talk this. And, you know, Wei Xiang would have put on his thinking chip to, to uh, figure out the question. Yeah. So they came prepared, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for this topic on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, they could be at, at home lap parking, but they're here doing this talk. So well done to the two speakers. And to all the listeners, terima kasih. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, for our Muslim friends, selamat berpuasa. And in a few weeks' time, uh, selamat hari raya kepada semua rakyat uh, Musliman Muslimin di Malaysia. Uh, uh, be, be safe at the bazaar. I know the murtaba yes. is very nice. But uh, remember the, please remember the SOP before you go in. And uh, with that in mind, uh, unless Wei Xiang and CG, anything else you want to say before I end the broadcast? Have a uh, good weekend, yeah, Richard, guys. Yeah, Richard, stand by for his carbo loading. Yeah. It's queuing up. It's queuing up at the Bazaar Ramadan. Ah, I don't upset my Muslim member lah. Member Melayu pun marah kat aku ni. Asyik yeah. tak makan makan, makan makan. Tak boleh lah. Don't, 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 don't disturb them. <laughs> okay, I can't wait to take part in the runs again. Uh, yeah. I nowadays, my only running is actually on a treadmill or around my housing estate. Uh, or sometimes I go to Taman Tun, uh, Kiara to walk up the hill. Uh, but you know, nothing beats the adrenaline of taking part in the 5 or 10 kilometer run. I'm not a 21 and 42. Uh, too fat to run, but 10 kilometer can lah, right? So, uh, the two of you don't leave the studio yet. I'm going to end the uh, live broadcast. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. Uh, my last message to all of you is that together, we will prevail. But we must prevail this together. We will work on this together. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Bye-bye. Thank you.